Coming up on Digital Music Trends 192 recorded on the 16th of July 2014, who knew that copyright could be so thrilling as we cover consent decrees, the Department of Justice, alleged collusions and more. Also on the show, the Fair Digital Deals Declaration by Wynn, Rhapsody on Radio, Soundwave introduces a major update, Soundcloud's a rumored equity deal with the majors and some big news from Pono. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andralian Ali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as a video and audio show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and uh, many more. So if you'd like to receive a weekly newsletter uh, about the latest show that have come out, uh, please do visit bit.ly slash DMT list or digitalmusictrends.com and sign up right there. And this week it's a real pleasure to start the show with three amazing guests. So first up, it's a pleasure to welcome Andrew Dubber to the show, a director of, at Music Tech Fest and professor of music industry innovation at Birmingham City University. So hi Andrew and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Um, it's going very well. Thanks for having me along. It's great to have you. And uh, it's also great to welcome to the show Eric McKay, Managing Director at My Media Insider and former VP of International Business Affairs and Business Development at Vivo. So hi Eric and thanks for uh, coming on. How's it going? Uh, yeah, really good. Uh, sorry you had to read out so much in terms of my title. It was always Fine. a horrific one to have to say publicly. <laughs> I, I practice it. It's, it's okay. I did it on stage last year, so I, th I, think, I think I can manage it in the comfort of my own room. It's fine. I did a, I did a lot of things on stage last year that I don't want to repeat now. <laughs> and uh, uh, joining us for the first part of the show, it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, Paul Fackler, a copyright lawyer and partner at Aaron Fox LLP. So hi, Paul, and thanks for joining us. So wh where are you based? Uh, right now, I'm based out of my home for the day. Um, I'm right. not in the New York City office, but uh, cool. New York City, Aaron Fox office, generally speaking. Perfect. And uh, so this week, uh, we are going to open the show by talking about rights. Uh, and uh, uh, please don't switch off uh, uh, specifically. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the U.S. saga involving publishers, raid courts, the Department of Justice, withdrawal threats, and collusion investigations. So I hope I've made it more interesting now that I've, I've phrased it like this. So uh, two main pieces of news. Here. So first of all, uh, the chairman of Sony ATV, Martin Bandier, last Friday in a letter to his songwriters, uh, threatened to pull out of ASCAP and BMI altogether should uh, the current review by the DOJ not meet the publisher's demand. So the DOJ is currently uh, reviewing uh, the uh, uh, the publish uh, the rates essentially that uh, companies like uh, Pandora are uh, paying uh, to publishers. And uh, uh, the second piece of news is that DOJ has sent out uh, uh, something that's called a CID, which is a Civil Investigative Demand for Documents to ASCAP, BMI, Sony ATV Music Publishing and Universal Music Publishing Group in connection with a review of the consent decrees that ASCAP and BMI operate under. So uh, Billboard reported that these actually uh, are a bit of a double-edged sword because the CID request may be used as part of an inquiry uh, on the coordination between uh, the publishers and ASCAP uh, while they were dealing with Pandora, for example. And, and this inquiry actually originated a few months back uh, from uh, Judge Denise Coates' uh, 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 judgment on the case of uh, the rates uh, uh, between uh, ASCAP and Pandora. So, uh, Paul, I want to, to start by uh, looking at the second news. So, have the publishers gotten more than they, they could chew or more than, more than they bargained for uh, by getting the Department of Justice involved? And what do you think uh, the DOJ is looking for specifically when, when looking at these coordination uh, issues? Well, I do think this is a, uh, a, you know, a classic case of uh, unintended backfire right. <laughs> in, in connection with the uh, major publisher's strategies to try to get out from under rate court regulation here in the United States for performance rights. Um, no question they did not want this to go this way. Uh, right. There's no question that the spin that you're starting to hear from ASCAP and BMI about how wonderful this is and you know it means that the Department of Justice is going to give them what they want. I don't know. You'd have to be pretty delusional uh, to read this as good news, the latest development right. as far as the subpoenas. I don't think it should be a surprise if you go back in time and read Judge Coates' decision in the Pandora case. Um, in that case, you talk about rights being a fairly dry and boring topic. That decision reads like a Martin Scorsese film. Right. Okay? If, you, if you read that actual decision, and it's not a question of Judge Coates uh, interpreting the evidence and making inferences. She's quoting the actual testimony and documents from the music publishers, okay? And it was pretty damning uh, right. uh, because the whole purpose behind that 
attempt to partially withdraw selectively some of their rights, or really not, that's not even an accurate way of framing it, partially withdrawing their rights only for certain types of licensees, right. namely digital music licensees, right? So that they could discriminate against them and use their market power in these direct negotiations. That was their whole strategy uh, behind that. So it shouldn't be surprising that as soon as they thought they accomplished that move, they immediately went out and started behaving like monopolists, which is what they are. <laughs> so um, that decision from Judge Cope had very specific examples of, right. you can only call it collusion, and she called it collusion, uh, between Sony ATV, Universal, through ASCAP, and of course the major publishers sit on the board of ASCAP. That's the only reason that this thing happened, this partial withdrawal, yeah. which is not only bad for the marketplace, but it's also bad for songwriters. If you read Judge Coates' decision, there's plenty of evidence that the songwriters were dead set against this. Right. Uh, because ASCAP at least has some measure of transparency and the direct payments going to songwriters. Maybe transparency isn't a good word, but at least the payments, once it goes through the black box, goes directly to the songwriters so that the publishers can't hide money in their accounting systems and take all of their wonderful deductions mm. that they've invented to keep as much of the money as possible. So essentially, it sounds like even if uh, the DOJ was to review uh, uh, the way things are handled and the publishers could go out and strike direct deals on the digital side, uh, major publishers may actually face tougher regulatory uh, uh, scrutiny. And in that sense, they wouldn't be able to uh, you know, uh, present themselves in the same way as maybe they did uh, last year when they were negotiating the deals with Pandora. Well, yeah, that's part of the problem is you got to be careful what you ask for because you just might get it, yeah. okay? <laughs> ASCAP and BMI have been making their bumper sticker argument is that the world has changed. These are archaic consent decrees from World War II, and they, they don't make sense in the digital world. Now, they don't say what it is about the digital world that suddenly makes the consent decrees unnecessary, right? Yeah. They never say that. The market power and the monopoly issues, the antitrust concerns – are all just, they're worse today, as a matter of fact, than they were back in 1940s when the industry was much less uh, uh, concentrated and right. consolidated. Uh, and I think one of the differences when the DOJ looks into this is, is, is going to be precisely what you said, that if you look at a major music publisher today, the way that they operate, they're essentially mini PROs because they've aggregated a vast catalog of rights in many instances, they don't own the copyrights. You know, a lot of times they do admin deals now, yeah. co-publishing deals. So in, in, in both a legal way and in, in, a, in a practical way, in the way that they function, they're very much like PROs and they have absolute market power. If you are a digital music service that needs a blanket license, see, the problem is the nature of the blanket license, yeah. Which, yeah, sure. is, which means you get one license for an entire catalog and you pay one price and, and it doesn't matter which songs you play because if you're programming music channels, that's what you need. There's no way to like clear the rights on a song by song basis. It just can't function that way. Yeah, sure. Um, but that is that the nature of that license is what creates the inherent competitive problems. And that's why the Department of Justice got involved right when these blanket licenses were first invented back in the 1940s. Absolutely. And so uh, I'm, I'm really interested, Eric, in hearing your thoughts because, of course, you worked uh, in business development at uh, a service that required uh, essential li uh, licenses to operate. And so uh, you dealt a lot with uh, collection societies uh, uh, through the years. And uh, what are your thoughts around uh, these issues that are happening in the U.S. and uh, around the possibility of uh, major publishers, uh, you know, becoming uh, disentangled from collection societies and actually, uh, you know, a digital service having to go directly to them to get uh, their catalog? Well, I think I'm in a very strange way kind of lucky that I've seen both sides of this. Right. So obviously I was at Vivo, I was negotiating against the publishers, but beforehand and people that have known me for quite some time will remember when I was the big bad wolf at Selas uh, licensing EMI publishing's rights on a pan-European basis. Right. So we were the ones that basically screwed up Europe, apparently. Um, <laughs> and, and this is basically a problem we've had and we've been dealing with it since 2008. And now I... I will always have some form of sympathy for the publishers in this situation because, especially in the US, you know, if you look at how the rights flow, you've got uh, the labels collect the mechanical rights and decide to pay a portion if they want 
publishers at some point and the publishers have to rely on their audit trails to be able to claim underpayments and it takes forever to get paid and then they have no power to negotiate rates and be commercial with services um, from the performing rights side yeah. so they're kind of sitting there as this kind of impotent bank not really doing that much and i say that with love because you know <laughs> they're my people um, impotent people not bankers um and i just think it's they're trying to replicate to a degree the control they have in europe they've seen a huge increase in revenues from being able to license direct they've been able to see services like spotify go from strength to strength um you know i think there's still an issue with people trying to license general entertainment um directly you know the publishers haven't quite got that one down yet because it's a yeah. much different market um, but to be able to rely on something from 1941 that gives them like 1.8 percent of revenue guaranteed is it's just so antiquated. And I, I completely agree with Paul's position. You know, they they obviously don't want to license everything on a track by track basis. But I think Marty's position, threatening to pull it, is a really strong negotiation tactic. And you know, from a service point of view, like Vivo, you know, Vivo relies on various different licenses to be able to operate in the way it does uh, and i think there's a flexibility that does exist in the u.s market that makes it possible so you know services like pandora are able to exist whereas pandora can't exist in markets like the uk because yeah. the rates are too high um but you know it, i think this is going to play out for quite some time because marty's not going to let it go you know marty wanted to buy emi he didn't let that go until he bought it Absolutely. And uh, uh, Andrew, so from, from your end, uh, uh, looking at this from a sort of a, an, an academic perspective and uh, also from your perspective as a director of Music Tech Fest, what do you make of these uh, uh, controversies? Uh, you know, of course, uh, you don't have a direct uh, stake in, in, in these negotiations. So uh, from an outsider's view, what, what do you see? Everybody has a direct stake in these sorts of negotiations. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that, and it's not just the people who are kind of rattling sabers or, or having their noses put out of joint or, or potentially aren't going to earn enough money or are going to pay too much money or, or whatever it happens to be. Because, uh, and I'm saying this with my academic hat on rather than with my Music Tech Fest hat on, uh, because Music Tech Fest is, is about uh, a creation of new types of instruments and new yeah. types of uh, experiences of music. But, but what it kind of feeds into is the idea, and, and to a large extent, and this is probably going to be unpopular with your audience here, but I don't really care. Um, because what I'm interested in as somebody who studies these things is how music makes meaning for people, how music contributes to society, how it enriches culture, how it does all those sorts of things. And people sort of arguing about how, how much of the slice of the pie that they can get from a financial point of view is a conversation that dominates all of these discussions. Yeah, but the and problem I want to be the guy in the but I want to be the guy in the corner waving a flag and going, it's actually more than just about who gets paid this week. It's it's something that actually is, is enriching our lives and it, it, it's 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 not just people making products and selling them in a marketplace. And so from that point of view, the, the kind of the, the posturing on this, which does go back and forth, which dominates all of the politi political and public discourse about this, overlooks the fact that most of the people for whom music is really, really important aren't being considered. And so these kind of, I mean, this is where copyright comes from, though, of course. You know, what, what is copyright trying to achieve is how do we make society better? How do we make culture better? How do we enrich the, the kind of the wealth of ideas and and you know the, the useful sciences is kind of the phrase all those sorts of things nobody is talking about that stuff nobody cares about that stuff all they're going is how can i spend less money or, or make more money and 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 so that the whole purpose of all of these discussions is buried in this kind of very instrumental thing about where's the cash but the problem in fact is that you know you were talking about the fact that everybody's talking about the money but also it's a case that if certain parts of catalogs are being withdrawn f because of these uh, uh, monetary negotiations going on, then that also affects the end user uh, tremendously because then you can only access certain types of music in certain types of way, in oh, certain look, types of scenarios. Stuff, I mean, this, this is completely tip of the iceberg stuff because right. actually massive portions of catalogs are already being withheld from the public. I would say, I mean, the, the kind of the best estimates are 90 to 95% of everything that's ever been released by the major record labels is currently not available for sale in any way, shape or form because they don't know who owns the rights. They don't know who the songwriter is or they don't know what the contracts are or they don't even know what they've got in a large extent. So there are masses and masses and masses of tapes in vaults that are decaying that can't be digitized and released to the public because it's in nobody's economic interests to do that. Now, from my point of view, 
that's nonsense. And so somebody withholding catalogue that is already in the marketplace, that's a very, very small problem in comparison to the, the, the massive, overwhelming majority of music that is not available to anybody. It's a very interesting perspective. And uh, uh, Paul, I wanted to uh, sort of uh, ask you a second question before I let you go. And, and that was all about uh, Sony ATV's uh, right to withdraw those tracks uh, in the sense that uh, we've seen Martin Mandir make this statement. Uh, uh, of course, this is more of a, of a positioning from Sony TV because they, they may be able to do that. The problem is that, for example, the MMF, the Music Managers Forum in the UK today issued a statement uh, uh, where it pointed out that uh, uh, Sony TV may not actually have the right to withdraw many of the works in its catalogue by non-US writers because those writers uh, have likely retained control over the allocation of their performance rights, uh, even though the publisher shares in the revenue. So, uh, where such writers have uh, then appointed a non-US society to administer the performance rights, uh, that society, uh, you know, then would uh, still be tied to ASCAP and BMI in order to collect the money that they have. So, uh, you know, what do you make of it? Do you think that uh, uh, the, the threat of Sony TV is feasible? Also, given that uh, these publishers don't really have an amazing database of what they own and what what the situation is around their rights. I, look, th this is a classic bully move. Uh, Marty Bandier is a classic bully. If you look at the way Sony ATV behaved in the Pandora decision, they behaved as classic bullies, okay? And what does a classic bully do when they're not getting their way? First, they threaten to punch you in the nose, and then if that doesn't work, they say, I'm going to take my toys and go home, okay? The letter, and he knows, first of all, in the songwriting community, they're very up in arms about this idea of having the, the, the licensing taken away from ASCAP and put into Sony ATV. As someone who, whose firm represents songwriters and heirs, God forbid you ever have to do an audit of any right. of these, you know, especially Sony ATV and now EMI, okay? I've never heard of an audit that showed that the, audit, that the songwriters were properly paid or even close, okay? Okay. Uh, so there's a good reason that the songwriters are against this too, okay? But really, as a practical matter, Sony has no way to bring the licensing function in. Now, the courts have already ruled that they can't play this game of taking it out just for the ones they can beat up in, in a negotiation and leave it in with respect to radio, TV, bars. Is Sony ATV really going to go around to every bar exactly, yeah. and do all that licensing? There's just no chance. So anybody who really knows how this licensing works knows that it's a silly threat. It's posturing because he's trying to scare the DOJ. He thinks he can bully the DOJ. Well, we saw how that went. Yeah, I mean, I'm, because, I'm sure the DOJ knows how it works, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this letter that he sent out to the songwriters, which was really designed for everybody else to read, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so... This letter, he's made this threat before. I mean, we just had roundtables. The Copyright Office held a series of public roundtables on music licensing reform. Uh, and all the, I was there, you know, testifying on behalf of certain clients. All the publishers, ASCAP, BMI was there. Sony ATV was there. They've been making these threats for, for in fact, they made these threats in order to bully ASCAP into a lack changing the rules so they could do that partial withdrawal in the first place. And, you know, so, so they've been making these threats for an awful long time. Yeah. This, in a sense, this letter is nothing new. And I don't think it's very realistic. It would certainly be madness. I mean, I'm not saying they, they wouldn't try to do it, I guess, I, it, it, but it would be madness because there's, there's no way, there's certainly there's nothing in place right now that could take the place of what ASCAP and BMI do for a Sony ATV. And in my view, you know, going back to the discussion before about looking at what's going to come out of this DOJ review, at, it, there's just as much of a chance as if they did do it, what it however they did it, whether it's through Sony in-house or whether they create some new entity, they're going to wind up under regulatory control anyway. Yeah. Ultimately, they have to because... If you look at what happened, you know, in the Pandora rates going up, up and up, you know, at least here in the States. And, I, I, you know, look, I'm sympathetic to songwriters, too. Maybe you can't tell it from what I've just been saying. I'm very sympathetic to the artists who actually make this stuff. OK, but there are bigger. The problem is in the United States, no digital streaming service has ever been profitable on a long term basis ever. So ultimately, this, this there has to be the problem, of course, is the record labels are getting paid so much. It's such a high rates here in the United States, that it's strangling the whole industry. Um, but the answer is not, well, the, the music publishers are like, oh, the, the record companies are getting 60, 70% of revenue. 
we want that too. Okay, well, get out your your, your calculator or your abacus or whatever you want to use. If, if it's the digital world, if you want to use the antiquated consent decree, which, by the way, has been amended dozens of times since right. 1941. So this idea that it's this thing from 1941 that's never changed, it's just factually untrue, but it's a bumper sticker they like to use. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, that's the real challenge there. I, 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 and I think that that threat has has backfired, frankly. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Eric, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we'll do the maths in our heads. Uh, I, I looked up the, I couldn't find the 2013 earnings from ASCAP, but the 2012 showed that, uh, uh, um, you know, ASCAP earned uh, just over 900 million uh, between U.S. and uh, uh, overseas uh, incomes uh, and had about 100 million of operating costs. Uh, and, you know, I just can't imagine Sony having that the kind of investment power behind it to be able to invest millions and millions and millions of dollars just creating an infrastructure, I suppose, saying to track these rights if it was to pull out. So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Well, you've, you've technically got an infrastructure in place already in Europe. You know, yes, the digital yeah. stuff is only a smaller part of it, and they would have this massive, massive issue trying to license bars, cinemas, all these kind of yeah, exactly. different things that become very difficult. But the infrastructure is there already, and if you're telling me that if they walked up to another society somewhere else in the world and said, we'll give you all these rights if you take this, if you take it on, right. like, I, there's infrastructure everywhere to do it. Whether or not regulatory they could have access to a US market from abroad is a very different thing. But the infrastructure is there. It's just how they make it work in practice. Because, you know, somebody's always going to want to make money out of this industry. And there's always going to be someone standing behind the people that are currently making it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, uh, Andrew, anything to add on this? <laughs> well, just that the, the idea that the infrastructure is there, uh, it, it's an equally broken infrastructure everywhere. I mean, as, as Paul kind of alluded I didn't to say earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but the the idea of something that w was an alternative that was transparent, that counted every play, that actually paid the artists whose music was performed uh, in all instances. I mean, and the, the idea that uh, close to you know twelve percent of all of the money collected from these revenues is is, is on administration is is nonsense today. Um, the idea that it would cost millions and millions to track and trace all of these plays. I mean, this is w with my kind of championing the innovators hat on sorry i'm getting i'm getting calls that are interrupting i'm hoping that's um i don't know if you're getting me but i'm, I'm no. getting calls that are interrupting and uh, i'm trying to uh, bump them off but um uh, the point that i'm making is it's it, with my kind of uh, championing the innovators hats on i'm sure there's a way that if the if the pros um, gave it some thought that you could design a system that counted every single play of every single work that accounted for it and that made sure that everybody got paid rather than uh, the, the, the large publishers sort of aggregating the bits that you can't really count or that are a bit tricky or a bit costly to find. You can solve those problems now and nobody's incentivized to, or at least not the people in charge of making sure it happens. And that's, I think, the disruptive change that needs to happen. We need something that's transparent. We need something that can count every single play of every white label record in a, in a, a nightclub and make sure that everybody who wrote songs gets paid that money. And at the moment, the whole system is set up to prevent that from happening. And, and that's the real problem at stake here. Right. A very, very interesting issue. And uh, uh, Paul, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. And uh, you definitely uh, shone, uh, sh uh, shone a light on uh, some of the issues that I definitely couldn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, elaborate on further. So <laughs> thanks Super. so much for joining us. And again, uh, uh, Aaron Fox, it's AaronFox.com if people want to go and check out the firm. Absolutely. Perfect. And thanks again for your time. Thank you. So uh, we're going to continue the show by uh, talking about uh, the Worldwide Independent Network. So uh, there's been a, an interesting development uh, yesterday and, and today, which is the fact that uh, the Worldwide Independent Network, which is called WIN, and we discussed this uh, to uh, no end in the last uh, few weeks, uh, given their uh, stance on YouTube, uh, has announced a new fair digital deals declaration. So uh, they essentially made up this declaration, which is, uh, uh, and they also uh, announced that today was going to be the uh, Worldwide Declaration Signing Day, which is going to be open to labels of all shapes and sizes. So uh, what does this consist of? So essentially what they've done is created a framework of, uh, uh, you know, pledges, I guess, that labels are taking by signing this uh, uh, that uh, ensure that artists are treated fairly. So some of the points that they make is, you know, are, you know, we will ensure that artists share of download and streaming revenues is clearly explained in recording agreements and royalty statements in a reasonable, uh, reasonable summary form. Also, they uh, pledge to account 
want to artists a good faith pro rata share of any revenues and other compensation from digital services that stem from the monetization of recordings but are not attributed to specific recordings or performances and so on and so forth is the uh, five key points here and so uh, the press release of course uh, invites both majors and independents to join but uh, given also the point that I just read uh, about the pro rata share of any revenues uh, even those outside of uh, specific uh, uh, you know uh, uh, revenues that are trackable to a sound recording uh, you know it's going to be unlikely it's unlikely that we're going to see uh, majors actually uh, sign uh, for this uh, uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts you know what do you make of these uh, uh, this uh, fair digital uh, deals declaration and also of a win's role I guess which is uh, really uh, taking a leap over the next uh, over the last few weeks uh, from being an organization that was uh, very little known and, and you know uh, very po- obscure in a sense uh, to being an orga- organization that is at the forefront of the independent sector uh, practically worldwide uh, Andre any thoughts on that well, I, I think these things are always uh, pieces of communication. And so the, the expectation right. that all things are going to sign up to it and, and people are going to get involved is almost secondary to the point that we are raising this issue and we're kind of bringing it to people's attention. And the, uh, the kind of the invitation to get the majors to join in on that is very much a please write about this because this is important. Yeah. Um, and so as a piece of uh, public relations and as a piece of communication, this is a very successful kind of uh, act. And it almost doesn't matter what happens next. Right. Um, and, and it seems to be this kind of series of really important issues that get raised within the public consciousness about what things are important when we talk about music, what things are important when we talk about um, who's at stake and whose livings are at stake and whose uh, you know, sort of art is at stake and whose you know, who's benefit is there. So, as like I say, as a piece of communication, as a piece of sort of exchange of meaning, there is something really interesting going on here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the initiative is supported by Flores Social Media Activity as well. Uh, they have a Twitter account called at win for music and a very long hashtag if you want to go and check it out and check the tweets. So it's called uh, hashtag fair digital deal for as a number artists. And the declaration has already had a 700 plus signatures as well. So, uh, um, Eric, fr- from your perspective, uh, you know, do you think that because this comes uh, sort of just a few weeks after Win made a big declaration around YouTube and took a stance on YouTube's, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, behavior uh, uh, with independence? Uh, do you think this is in any way relatable to that? Is it a completely separate initiative, or does it essentially echo a, a need for independence to show that there needs to be more transparency in the industry as to what is happening on deals? Um, you know, all these things I think. Uh always going to be interlinked um the the youtube situation when it really kicked off kind of at the end of may i thought was it was a really interesting move from kind of win and merlin to just call them out publicly because you know google is an entity are and i've said it so many times in the past they're they're really good at kind of throwing their weight around to get what they want and they're not used to people saying no to them you know it happened before on youtube many years ago with um, warners basically going well screw you we're taking our content down until they got a better deal out of it Um, and i think that the indies have really kind of they've all got on the same page now and they realize that they can't be pushed over anymore um yeah. and i you know the likes of emmanuel de Buratel from because um signing up to uh, the declaration today i think is really really good um the the bit about the pro rata um revenue splits i think they're going to struggle i'm not gonna lie i think that's insanity to think anybody's going to agree to it um but i think as kind of really solid kind of lines in the sand it's a really good starting point point. Yeah. Um, and like you say this they've got 700 signatures well over 700 signatures already and it's a groundswell that needed to happen you know rara yeah. got into hot water with merlin um a while back when they decided to launch the service without actually getting any of the indie content and it's just i think it's now a really good thing as um dubbo says to just really say to people you know you as a consumer of music you love what we do how bad would you feel if our stuff wasn't there? You need to be aware of this. And it's just a really nice press story. You yeah. know, I was watching it unfold this morning and just, I think it's a great thing to do, but I just wonder if all of the points are actually going to be actionable. <laughs> I the, the, the other, sorry, the, the flip side of that, though, of course, is, is yeah. and, and you're right, the, this is a really good kind of important statement to make about the value of, of uh, creators' work and all that sort of thing. But when you get to the point of, well, how would you feel if we took our music away, everybody would just go, we'd listen to all the other music. You know, we're not going to run out mm. of music. There's, there's no shortage. Uh, and if you took your record away, maybe I wouldn't get to hear your record. Maybe I'd miss out on something really good. But I'm not going to be short of other good things to listen to. So as a kind of a, a again, this is, a, I'm going to take my ball and go, 
home thing, that's actually quite a, a, an unhelpful thing. But engaging in the space and going, you know, well, actually, m you know, you value what I do, not in the sense that, that, you know, you would suffer if I took it away, but in the sense that together we create something that's of value. Um, I think that's a really important thing to bring to people's attention. But as yeah. soon as you sort of start waving the stick around instead of just the carrot, um, you start to run into problems with, with audiences and go, you know what, I've actually got lots of music to listen to. Absolutely. And I mean, let, let's take it from a, from a perspective of also somebody that is uh, looking to sign to a major. I mean, if you look at, for example, a, a new artist and they uh, have an offer from a, a large independent and an offer from a major label, the independent has signed this uh, declaration day. If, if we look at a uh, declaration, if we, if we put aside the press and, and that, that aspect, do you think it could actually make a difference to an artist's decision to go with a label or another, uh, given their stance on trying to be more you know, equitable? I think there's so many different things that come into play when an artist decides who they're going to sign to yeah. and how they how they engage with the industry as a whole or if they even bother to engage with the industry as a whole you know there's so many ways of people just doing their own thing i know it obviously it's a really old thing but like amanda palmer she just kind of stuck two fingers up probably pulled her pants down at the same time and just went i'm doing this my way because that's what i can do because my audience has given me the ability to do it and i think the the idea of going, oh, I've got a deal from a major on the table, should I take that, is so old-fashioned. Yeah. Um, you know, you have like an Ariana Grande who did you know, a billion tweets in a day. Yeah. Things like that are amazing, but the amount of artists that sign to majors for huge amounts of money and just like fall on their ass when actually they probably would have done better on independent you know you don't know who they are because they're they're the unspoken masses um <laughs> i've got know, a few I've, friends there <laughs> they're, the, they're the 95 percent of uh, artists signed to major record labels who aren't mm. getting pushed aren't getting promoted who aren't you know their their records aren't doing anything but it's, it's one of those things that in most cases as soon as you're being chased by a major record label you don't need them uh yeah. and and it's it's proof of that and so it's kind of it's a catch-22 but that's not to say that you can't use that to your benefit benefits if you know because there are people who are really good at marketing there are people who are really good at kind of managing certain things that you might not be good at but um you've got the choice now obviously to do different things yeah but it, it does very much depend on what the artist wants to do i mean there have been lots of these kind of uh fair trade music type initiatives on the internet and people sort of doing stuff that's about we we demand these sorts of things in order for this to be equitable and fair and everybody should kite mark their record label with these sorts of policies and not everybody does in fact hardly every, anybody does um and people kind of work it out so yeah. it's you know, horses for courses, really. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, it's an interesting story. We'll definitely keep an eye on it, and uh, I'm sure it's not the last we hear of when. I think uh, independents are realizing that having a single voice uh, that echoes uh, their concerns uh, is a powerful thing, and so I think we're going to hear uh, more along these lines in the future. Uh, Andrea, I wanted to uh, take a, a, sh a short break to ask you about a music tech fest. So, uh, what is happening? What is it for people that might not have heard it, heard about it before? And uh, uh, what are the events coming up in the next few months? Okay, well, Music Tech Fest is a festival of music ideas. Uh, there's a lot of people, the first mistake they make is they think it's a conference, and it's not. Um, it is very much uh, modeled on the, the uh, festival of ideas, like the uh, philosophy festivals and the literature festivals, but this is about music and technology and the intersection of those things. So it's, it's everything from academics to artists to uh, record labels to uh, hackers to inventors, all going, look at this thing that I made. It's, I've invented this noisemaker, and let me show you what it does, and does anybody want to play with it? It's 15 minute back to Back presentations on a Jules stage. It's kind of a bit Jules Holland. We hop between the two of them and we showcase all of these great new ideas, new innovations, new, new thoughts. Uh, about music and technology and where those things overlap. And while that's going on, we have a 24-hour hack camp where um, organizations have, have put challenges forward, have sponsored hack challenges for people to say, um, let's team an artist up with a hacker to create something. And it's not just sort of the, the hacks on screens that you get at a lot of uh, music style hack events. It's not just about APIs. It's about physical objects in three-dimensional space. It's about people getting away from the laptops. It's about performance uh, and all those sorts of things. And we kind of showcase those on the main stage at the end of that 24-hour hackathon. So essentially, it's a big party uh, that celebrates um, music and technology and ideas and, and all those things. Uh, it's at the home of the London Symphony Orchestra, actually, in London, uh, at the LSO awesome. St. Luke's, which is, which is right on Old Street, you know, Silicon Roundabout, which is really cool. That's the 5th to the 7th of September. Then we're in Berlin at Factory Berlin, which is where Ableton now set up and, and yep. uh, uh, you know, a bunch of other really great tech companies. Um, and uh, that's Berlin is in about then we're in Paris at Aircom in November. We're in New York in December. 
October, and then it starts to get busy. Uh, we've got 11 Music Tech Fest events scheduled for 2015 all over the world. Amazing. Um, and we've turned down more than we've accepted. So we keep getting asked to do them in different places, and of course the big question is right now we need to pay for them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so we work, because we want to make this, this is the other thing that's, that's unlike a tech conference, because tech conferences and, and music industry affairs tend to be really expensive events. Yeah. It can be it can be a thousand pounds for a ticket. Uh, and we want to bring in the crowd that, that can afford maybe 20 quid for a ticket or 10 quid for a ticket. We want the people who are kind of the kids or the innovators or the hackers. And we're working with young people. And we're working with with all sorts of kind of excluded groups and, and doing really sort of interesting things around music and technology. So we want to invite those. So um, we're trying to do it in such a way that um, we can make it as affordable to everybody. Uh, we stream everything online. We record every presentation. We put it all on YouTube. And it's all about kind of getting this stuff out there. And the, the final piece of the puzzle really is we do a kind of an after what we call the after party which is basically an academic symposium uh, on the Monday after the weekend which a whole lot of people who have been invited have been at Music Tech Fest and presenting and, and uh, reflecting on what goes on sit in a room and talk about what it all means and, and try to get something out of it and we did this at Microsoft Research in Boston when we did Music Tech Fest there earlier in the year and we came up with a manifesto for the future of music technology research as a result of this. Uh, Nancy Bame and Jonathan Stern who are really kind of highly respected Respected academics in this field kind of took it upon themselves to, to curate essentially a manifesto and there's some really good stuff in there it's at musictechifesto.org yeah. and it's this yeah. document that you can sign up to and it has basically become the charter and the manifesto for the music tech fest sort of movement if you like but it brings in all of these different stakeholders uh, for music and technology uh, and it's a really good place for new collaborations new experiments it's a it is totally an experimental and uh, improvisational space, but the stuff that comes out of it is amazing. Awesome, and that's at musictechfest.org. You can go and check that out. And uh, Eric, on, on your front, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's, uh, what's going on and uh, what your new company is all about. Uh, well, so it depends who you ask. Uh, if you ask my husband, I'm unemployable, um, <laughs> but I like to see it as more a kind of entrepreneurial way. Yes, um, so, self-unemployed. Yeah, basically. Uh, no, that's I, what I am. I, that's, yeah. that's, that's how it works, yeah. <laughs> and it's working well, apart from maybe the hairline for the yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I basically decided that I was doing the same thing day in, day out for so long that I just wanted to kind of break out and try and do something a little bit different. So uh, I have decided to go down the consultant route, which is obviously not different in the slightest, um, <laughs> but that's so that I can carry on paying my bills. Yes, um, sure. So I'm working with... Uh, you get more variety, holders. though. That's, that's, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Exactly. So um, I'm working with some rights holders and some digital services at the moment just to kind of help them kind of really work their way through the market, you know, helping rights holders get through some of the backlog of stuff they've got. Because I think that's one of the other issues that a lot of people are facing at the moment is there's so many services starting at the moment and yeah. people are kind of drowning in the workload just to try and help navigate it a little bit. Uh, but the kind of end goal is I'm, I'm working on building a platform with uh, a couple of people to do, uh, it kind of, it's an online working platform to help change the way that the media industry engages with uh, professionals to be able to kind of scale their um, expertise base on a need by need basis. So it's, I, I am it's, intrigued. <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to start to take a bit of shape, but Great. yeah, um, awesome. it's it's getting there. Do you have a site yet? Uh, no, at the moment I'm just using uh, mymediainsider.com, um, which I'm just basically blogging any old crap um, just to kind of just keep <laughs> some form of traffic going sure. there. But yes. at the end of the day, it will be mymediainsider.com. Yeah. Perfect, awesome. And uh, now let's uh, move on to talk about, uh, I want to talk about radio for a second here, uh, because Andrea, of course, is a, is a, is a real expert in the, in the space of radio, and uh, so I always try and fit in a, a story about online radio when he's on That's the show. That's very kind of you. Yes. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, I wanted to talk about Rhapsody's unradio service. So that's a service that I actually haven't covered on the show quite yet. So, uh, you know, it's not new, but uh, uh, Rico did an interesting piece on it. Uh, so I thought it was uh, worth uh, bringing it up. So essentially, you know, Rico talks about the fact that this unradio service, which essentially is uh, uh, a service that Rhapsody created by partnering with uh, T-Mobile, uh, and uh, which is uh, less expensive than a normal subscription, but still allows some level of uh, offline caching for users, uh, it could be an interesting proposition for consumers that are not prepared to pay $10 a month uh, for uh, the full service, but they do want uh, uh, an internal radio that uh, doesn't have adverts, uh, that allows for some sort of caching that has a, a you know a, a decent breadth of catalog and so um, 
and that's in the context of course of uh, us talking a lot on the show about uh, providing alternative uh, uh, models for uh, uh, the music industry that are not the ten dollars a month and they're not the free but they're somewhere in between so uh, this of course is presented as a radio uh, in, in the sense that it is uh, marketed as one as an unradio and uh, uh, so andrew f- from your perspective is this something that could work and uh, what do you make of it in, in the wider context of of radio of course which which you are very keen on as still being seen as a curation platform of course well uh, to, to an extent i mean i, I I'm, I'm nostalgic about radio uh, which is kind of uh, counterproductive because I, I tend to write about uh, in fact my, my book that came out at the end of last year was called radio in the digital age right. and a lot of that is how is this now configured and what does radio mean and actually one of the first things i conclude in the book is is that radio there is no there is no way to define radio. There are no kind of essential characteristics that make something radio. It doesn't have to be live. It doesn't have to be geographically located. It doesn't have to be kind of a, a continuous stream. You know, all these things. Lots of things are being called radio that you could point and say, well, that's not radio. And and it, you'd have a good argument, but there is no one thing that you can say. Well, these are what this is. This is one thing that radio must have in order to be called radio. So, uh, kind of the flip side of that is you could pretty much call anything you like radio, but right. that's not what happens either. Um, and so there are sort of these understandings of of you know if it's music and it's streaming and it's not something that I own or if it's you know these, these sorts of things. There is kind of a, a radio ish element to that. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting about that is that that's always nationally defined. It's always defined by geographic national boundaries. And, and the, the legislation that applies to that and where you can receive something, you know, you can't get Pandora in some countries and you can get it in others and those sorts of things. Um, but uh, but the idea of localization is something that, that um, these sorts of kind of online music streaming services struggle with because actually here is just a bunch of songs and here is another bunch of and, and it could be a jukebox parked anywhere in the world. Yeah. And so that kind of that the, there are these kind of interesting dynamics about that um but the the, the what i call the bloom problem uh this this idea of trying to find a price point that isn't 10 but it isn't zero and it's, it's something that people can afford what can we give them for that that's a really tough problem to solve and i'm, I'm i actually wonder if it is the problem to solve if, if it's the kind of the make or break thing because rather than saying uh, you know, can we get people to pay ten dollars a month or ten pounds a month or whatever it might be for a music stream? Um, is there a way in which you can say, can we make something that's actually worth ten pounds a month right. uh, by actually doing things that radio is really good at, by doing things like localization, by doing things like contextualizing, by having somebody goes, you know what, you should listen to the song; it's really good. Let me tell you something about it. Let me interview the person who made it. Those sorts of things that that radio is traditionally kind of thought of as being really good at. Nobody who's doing these kind of online music services that are essentially a database and a cupboard are, are, are trying to replicate and trying to create value and, and solve that problem. So, um, I mean, the, the, the kind of the Spotify miracle, if you like, is, is not about how much gets paid to artists or how much gets paid to record labels, yeah. but the fact that most people who are now on Spotify, the, the, the 120 quid a month that they're now, uh, sorry, 120 quid a year that they're now paying represents a massive increase in their spend on music annually. Yeah. Um, and that's that's amazing. That's a, that's a really interesting thing. Um, but that problem of, well, I don't really want to spend 120 quid a month on music, but there might be something that I am, sorry, 120 quid a year, uh, but there might be something that I am prepared to spend 10 quid a month on that has that as an element of it. And is there anything, so instead of kind of, can we can we budget you know cut rate this thing yeah. can we add more value to this i think that would be a more interesting problem to solve but um that's not what these people have chosen to do and that's not what you've asked me but yeah. um no, it, it seems like a me too kind of service to me i mean it really yeah. seems like um oh yeah, yeah we'll we'll do that as well or if there's a way in which we can solve this problem because when it comes down to it this is not a technological problem that's being conquered finally yeah. it is just a bunch of songs and a playlist and a cover that are being uh, streamed in one way or the other and and it doesn't Honestly, if you're listening to a Beyonce single, it doesn't really matter who you're getting it from. So it, it doesn't kind of make that much of a difference. I mean, I guess like the fascinating thing for me is to see companies like uh, uh, Rhapsody and the Slacker, of course, the so Slacker have done this uh, actually first. So they, they were the ones that started by offering an interest, uh, an in, uh, streaming service and then a premium stream, uh, radio service. And then it became, uh, became a fully fledged uh, uh, on-demand streaming service as well. So you have different uh, uh, potential entry points on, on the price. But I, I like the idea of companies that have a mass this huge catalog and they have all the rights in place 
to play with that catalog and try and find different ways to propose it to customers through different channels to figure out if there are pockets of the market that are being left out. In, in this case, of course, the uh, Rhapsody is, is more of an experiment. You know, Bloom was pointing, you know, putting all, all of its chips in, in that particular basket. But uh, I, I think it's fascinating to see this experiment happening. Uh, Eric, what do you make of, of uh, uh, Rhapsody's move in this case? Honestly, I don't really get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, I just think it's a bit crap. Um, which... Love it. It's only four bucks a month, though. <laughs> yeah, I, but yeah, I think for me the so most it's cheap crap. <laughs> yeah, it's cheap crap. And now, yeah. my people, we're all about the cheap crap. We yeah. really are. We're the only ones that still buy Madonna's music. So you know, I don't know where to go with this. Um, um, but I the don't know. Just... You mean? Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the. The service as a whole, like, you know, as Andrew's saying, it, it just doesn't seem kind of like it's trying to break any kind of barriers and do something interesting. Right. It's just very samey. I think, you know, the only thing that I kind of really take away from this that I do think is interesting is it's yet another example of a telco doing something that's hard bundled that doesn't take away your data allowance. You know, for me, the biggest yeah. problem that we've always faced is, well, as a kind of connected music market, is that we're bound by the amount of data that a telco tells us we can use a month or we're bound by incredibly high roaming charges you know what would be really interesting to see is if you've got uh, deutsche telecom or telefonica or whoever going do you know what i'm going to hard bundle your spotify or your whatever into this and i'm not going to charge you when you roam with it either now that's something interesting yeah but this as a service it's just, it, I don't know. I don't really understand what it's trying to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Sorry, I mean, Rhapsody. I, 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 was, I was a positive voice in this. Uh, I, I, was, I, don't know, I don't know why, but I, I felt like I, I, I felt good about this story. I don't know why. It's uh, <laughs> because Rhapsody's been around for so long. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're real triers, and I really love that about them. Yeah, mm. absolutely. And uh, I'm just going to take a quick break and I'm going to uh, play a short video that I recorded with the CTO of the company Soundwave. They announced a major uh, new release uh, today and so I caught up with them. And there's a, uh, also, if you're watching the video, there's a short uh, demo of how the new app works. So check that out. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the show Aidan Salini. Uh, hi, Aidan, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hi, Andrea. Thanks for having me. Everything is going very good here at Soundwave. It's great to have you. And so essentially, it's, it's uh, almost exactly a year uh, since I did the feature on Soundwave. And so yes. uh, there's some news of the company. But first of all, I wanted to ask you about sort of what the past year has been like, uh, how the platform has grown and uh, sort of what's been going on. Yeah, I mean, it's been a very exciting year at some, here at Soundwave. Um, as you say, we launched about 12 months ago. Um, in those 12 months, our app has been downloaded a million times um, over Android and iOS. Uh, we have people in 190 different countries, um, and we've tracked over 100 million plays. I mean, so with usage, uh, amount of songs we tracked, everything, we're doing a lot better than we thought we would. So everyone at Soundwave is, is very happy at the moment. Absolutely. And so, uh, so uh, talking about uh, sort of the engagement uh, figures you've had, so how are you, people, uh, how are you seeing people interact uh, with the app uh, uh, up until today? Yeah, I mean, engagement has been, has been very, very good. Um, we've been tracking it from day one um, and we're very happy. I mean, people are using it to track their songs. So you have people who are just interested in knowing what they're listening to themselves. Um, we have a lot of those users. We also have users that are interested in what other people are listening to. Um, so they're coming on every day to take a look, to see what their friends are listening to, see what their family are listening to, and to discover new music. Um, so we, we're finding that we have kind of many different use cases, um, but a lot of different people using the app in a lot of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, today, of course, uh, we're, we're uh, going to chat uh, about the update uh, to the app that uh, you're rolling out uh, yeah. uh, next week, essentially. So uh, tell me a little bit about the, the background to that. Of course, uh, every time you do a refresh on an app, it's, it's a lot of work and uh, you need to figure out what your priorities are. So so what, what were you looking at improving uh, about the app? Of course. Um, so for the first 12 months, um, we spent a lot of time uh, in the technical smart. So we wanted to know what people are listening to across all the devices and all the different music players. So um, we're now tracking on, on native iPhone, native Android, Spotify, Audio, Deezer, Google Play. And, and over the 12 months, we kind of expanded our portfolio and really, really cemented the ability to track all the songs. So, I mean, we've seen people use the app in many different ways. Um, and we've kind of track this over the last 12 months and using this this data we figured out exactly what people are doing and what people aren't doing on the app 
and we push the stuff that they are doing to the front of the app. So essentially what, what Soundwave is now is it's a place to go to share music and right. to talk about music. Yeah, sure. And so let's, uh, let's go and have a look at the app. It would be great if you could guide me through uh, some of the new features and sort of uh, 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 tell me about the changes that have been implemented over the last uh, few months. Absolutely. Um, so the, the homepage of the app originally 12 months ago was the timeline. The timeline tells you exactly what your friends and family and yourself are listening to. So yeah. you can scroll through the timeline and see exactly what your friends and family are listening to. Um, again, I mean, this is the, one of the, the main pages of the app, but we've tidied it up and we've made it a lot simpler and made the, the most important features and put them to the forefront. Yeah. Um, but I think that the piece we're talking about is definitely groups. Yeah. So if you go onto the, the tab where we have the groups, so I mean, one of the key points of this new app compared to the old app is all about groups. It's all yeah. about creating a group of friends or family. So I can create a group with six of my best friends um, and we can go in and talk about music and share music to one another. A perfect example um, is this group that I'm in with yourself, Andrea, and the title of the group is Best Music to Work To. So I'm listening to music like I always do in any of the music players. I come across a song that I think, yes, Andrea would love this song, and I can share that song straight away into the group. Um, and there are all the songs and all the conversations that people have had about those songs. That's great. And so, um, actually, it's interesting because uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you prioritize when you just hit the play button? Which service gets hit first? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So if you go into one of the, one of the, the groups, I'll show you. Um, so on all the song, song cards, you have a 30-second clip. So you press the play right. button there, and you get a 30-second clip. So no matter what music player you're using to listen to songs and um, you'll always get a 30 second clip but then if you go into one of the songs yeah perfect so here you get the the youtube video so at the very top again no matter what you do you press the play there you're going to play the youtube video of the song um, again if you like listening to songs on spotify or or deezer you still have it on youtube so yeah. you're happy with that um, you think it's a good song you want to actually use your own mu music listening service so we are, now have a deep integration with spotify or on deezer so i don't know andrea are you a spotify user or yeah. audio user uh, spotify so, yeah so if you're a Spotify user, you simply click on the Spotify button, it opens it up in Spotify and you can consume the song in Spotify. Oh, perfect. So essentially what this means is um, no matter where your friends are listening to music, um, you can all share music into one place. And no matter where you want to consume the music, you can consume the music in that place as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, this is actually uh, going to be a, an interesting feature because uh, obviously uh, once you set up Soundwave uh, to, to automatically pull in your information, uh, it becomes, uh, I guess, it became harder to engage people in a conversation around it. But with the exactly. messaging, with the messaging app, you can actually create all sorts of different interesting uh, uh, conversations around music. And uh, uh, for example, uh, I'm in a group on WhatsApp where uh, people share what kind of gigs they're going to and that kind of thing. But uh, you can easily see foresee people using this to do it uh, and actually share the music by the bands that they're going to see so that people can actually listen to it rather than just uh, reading what, what bands are going to see. Exactly. I mean, this app is in beta at the moment and we have around 200 people on it and the amount of different groups that we've, we've seen being built is amazing. People are creating groups around the band, people are creating groups around an event just like you were talking about and people are also creating groups around genres. So we have a lot of groups on um, so rock and people are inviting their friends and they think they, they like rock songs. But also you have, you have groups about general music. So I'm in a couple of groups with my friends and I know we all have different types of music, but it doesn't really matter. So I have a group with the six of them in there and we just share all the songs that we think each other would like. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I, I feel like has changed, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, beforehand it was kind of hard to find new, uh, other people to add to uh, to the app in the sense of or discover people uh, in your local area and that kind of thing most of the data was uh, was anonymized so has that changed uh, over, over the course of the of the year yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the data is still anonymized, but what we have put into Soundwave now is, is a recommended section. Right. So here you have, um, instead of having to search for a user uh, through your Facebook friends, through your Twitter friends, or just generally searching for their name, we've done the hard work for you. I think the really smart thing about this recommended section um, is it gets smarter as you play more music. So if Soundwave realizes that actually you're into Iron Maiden, then it's going to recommend other people that are into Iron Maiden. Yeah. Um, if you're into Miley Cyrus, then it's going to recommend people uh, who are into Miley Cyrus. So so Soundwave is all about following the right people to find the right music. Absolutely, and uh, that's great. And so, uh, you know, uh, the app ha has, uh, I guess by the time this goes live, the app will have hit the, uh, uh, the App Store uh, internationally. So I guess people can go and uh, download the update and check that out. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was great chatting today and look forward to seeing what's going to happen with the company uh, over the next uh, 12 months again. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for your time, Andrea. And uh, next, uh, I want to talk about SoundCloud. So SoundCloud is having some interesting times uh, uh, lately. And uh, the 
latest reports uh, which come from uh, Bloomberg, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, are that the company is uh, closing in on deals with the major labels uh, to license uh, uh, their catalog onto the service, uh, but uh, th they are also reportedly giving away uh, uh, an equity stake in the company to the majors, uh, uh, somewhere between 3 and 5 percent each, uh, and uh, apparently the deal would value SoundCloud between 500 and 600 million, which is a little bit below uh, what the latest valuation was from a VC standpoint, but apparently that's a different one than uh, when you look at equity discussions. Uh, and majors would, of course, or, or of course also secure uh, a percentage of future revenues apart, as part of the licensing terms. And uh, uh, so, you know, there's not a lot to go on here, but uh, it definitely marks a, a a huge shift, if, if this is true, in, in SoundCloud strategy. Uh, you know, the, the appearance of millions of tracks of, of back catalog from, from majors uh, would uh, significantly alter the service. Uh, uh, I wonder how independent labels will take uh, the equity stake idea. I mean, we haven't heard anything from Merlin, so it may well be that they are still negotiating with Merlin ar around that uh, on whether uh, Indies would get an equity stake as well. Uh, and it, of course, it's moving away from the initial idea of the company, which was uh, around music creators. And so uh, throwing all this into the bucket, what do you make of this story and the evolution that SoundCloud might uh, take if this is all true? Uh, Eric, any thoughts on that? Um, I, <laughs> where, to, where to begin? Where to um, start? You know, I think it... SoundCloud is a great service. I love it. Yeah, SoundCloud. we all love it. I think it. it's amazing. <laughs> that's um, that's what the premise of all this. <laughs> the only yeah. people that currently pay SoundCloud are the labels for their professional services. So I don't really understand where the labels are getting this cut of future revenue from unless SoundCloud have got an actual strategy for monetization going forwards. So when they when they pull that together, you know, I've heard many, many different rumors about the various strategies they've got for being able to monetize yeah. the content. It's going to be interesting to see what their huge user base actually think of it and whether or not they decide that the service is worth sticking around for. Um, but, you know, equity, there's always a huge issue when it comes to this. Spotify went through this minefield, you know, the artist pushed back over labels getting a huge amount of equity so that if the service ever flips, you know, the artist don't yeah. see the benefit from it, the label does. I think that could be quite a difficult conversation for them to have. So getting the FAC's opinion on this, I think it'd be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, I think they've built such a good service with a huge amount of traffic. I'm really interested to see if the deals leak because <clears throat> the past period would kill them on its own. So it's to see with what this equity is doing in terms of past liabilities. And also going back to our first point, you know, publishing is going to cripple them. Like, <laughs> because publishers, uh, if you're looking uh, at somebody like PRS in the UK, um, they can't take equity. So they have a published position on their tariff and they're constantly talking to SoundCloud about what they're going to do. I, I just think it's, it's interesting that they're talking to the labels about moving it forwards. But that this is just like the first of many, many hurdles that's going to keep smacking them in the face over the next probably kind of two or three years because it's not going to go away quickly. <laughs> it's it it sounds like an uphill struggle, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, that that's also the nature of the of the industry. You know, if you ha if you have to go retroactively from going to where the service is now to going back and making all the deals, it just becomes such a huge headache. Yeah. than doing it the other way around where you actually get the, the, the deals done first and then you yeah. launch a service. Which is also a headache, to be Which fair. Which is also a headache, yeah. but at least yeah. once you've launched a service, you sort of know, know where you stand. Uh, I really want them to succeed, though. Yeah, I really, absolutely. really do. Because yeah, it's look, just we all, everything we all about love it is SoundCloud. incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, that's the thing. We all love SoundCloud. And, and every conversation about that is going to start with that caveat. Yeah. I love SoundCloud. <laughs> but, and I think that's the problem that they bought themselves with so much investment and so much pressure to, to succeed and be powerful. Right. Um, I, and there are all sorts of conversations to, to be had about the kind of the, the growth fetish of, of businesses who want to get this kind of VC money and then want to kind of build up millions of users and millions of kind of uh, equity valuation and then sell it because really that's the only way to make any money out of it at all um, because the revenue is just not going to be there. In a, Last in a FM. <laughs> Last year, they had all sorts of other uh, problems going for it, and and it's another longer conversation for another day. But but I think that the but it's not just 
the labels who pay for SoundCloud. And I know, as somebody who pays for SoundCloud, I know that to be the case. And I know that my son pays for SoundCloud, and he's an electronic musician, and he puts his stuff up there, and it's all value for him, for the audience that he has to hear his music, to, to put it out there. And, and he's not on a label, and he's not you know doing anything. So And, and there are lots of people like him making dubstep in a bedroom and, and doing kind of cool stuff and using it in the way that you would use Flickr for images or YouTube for videos. And that's what SoundCloud's really, really good at. But the problem that I have with this, and this is kind of the problem that I have with Spotify as well. This is why I stopped being a Spotify user. As soon as the equity goes to the major record labels, the underlying principle is that every single artist on that website makes money for the record labels, whether they're signed to them or not. And, and I, I, have a, I have a conceptual problem with that um, because a lot of the people who aren't signed to major record labels aren't signed to major record labels because they don't want to be. And the idea that the thing that allows them to not be signed to a major record label is suddenly making money for the major record labels that they have a problem with is a problem. And I yeah. think that's a problem for a massive number of people. I, and to, to be honest, it's very, very similar to the problem that killed MySpace. And what killed MySpace was not that they weren't very good at marketing, but because they had every freaking band on the planet um, but wanted to put adver advertisement for cheap children's like suspiciously cheap children's clothing all over it because that's what they could sell and nobody could opt out of that advertising nobody could choose how the money was being made by whom for whom and in what way and everybody went you know what this is a bit icky I'm going to go somewhere else which is less icky which has actually turned into something that's even more kind of unbelievably icky in the process and, and that'll kind of shake out in time I guess but, yeah. um, but there is this thing of you know you have to think about not just well we've got all these users and we need all this money and we've got to kind of pay all this back how are we going to do this um, and if you come up with answers that are um, counter to the culture of the vast majority of the people who use your service you've got a problem yeah and the thing is I like I've always said that the only way that this would work would be if they adopted a YouTube model where artists can go into the platform and opt in opt out decide if they want to monetize but that also requires the service to have a huge advertising infrastructure behind it which of course youtube had because it had google's advertising infrastructure behind it but it's got to be something other than advertising i mean the thing i love uh, the thing i've always loved about Flickr, the thing i loved about soundcloud was that you give me something for free and that's really cool and that's useful and the more that i want to use it the more that i want to go you know what i'm going to pay you money so that you solve this problem for me why can't that be a business model why can't that be the whole story why do we need millions and millions and millions of, of, of dollars in valuation in order to make something that is sustainable and useful and practical and lots of people can do it. It, it, the, the fact that, okay, well, we need venture capitalists because suddenly we're, we're really uh, important and, and exciting. And this is something that could have been grown naturally and something that could have... I mean, look at Mixcloud. Own. That's a different story. That's Absolutely. A... I mean, look at Bandcamp. This is, this is one of these stories where the, these things are not about, we want to be the biggest, we want to be the, the most important, we want to be the greatest. You know, we just want to be a good business that makes money and we want to, to provide a service that people appreciate. And I, I don't see what's wrong with that. And I, I think that's the yeah. thing that, uh, you know, I love SoundCloud, but it's let me down. Yeah. Right, and uh, finally, the last story of the day. Oh, actually, uh, I'm going to... Uh, no, I've, I've done that already. Okay, I'm, I'm losing the plot. Uh, finally, the last story of the day. I wanted to talk about uh, Neil Young's Pono before we go. And uh, uh, that's making the headlines today for a couple of different reasons. So, so first of all, there's a management shakeup uh, as John Hamm, the current CEO, is stepping down and is being replaced by none other than Neil Young himself. So Neil Young as a CEO of a tech company. Very interesting. And additionally, Pono announced striking a partnership with the UK-based B2B music provider Omniphone. So so the company will power Pono's high resolution digital music service and uh, yeah. it seems like a really good decision to lean on a third party provider because I guess I was pretty skeptical on the company being able to actually create a whole a back end infrastructure to host and deliver and ingest uh, the high resolution file so it makes complete sense for them to lean on a third party that has done this in the past. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they integrate the catalog that they already ingested themselves because as far as I understood Pono had already done quite a bit of work in sourcing high res masters from labels so what was going to happen to that is going be uh, interesting to see uh, you know what do you guys make of this uh, uh, Neil Young as a CEO of a, of a uh, tech company and also uh, this uh, decision decision to outsource uh, uh, their uh, you know the requirements on the technical front uh, Andrew well I, I'm not qualified to evaluate uh, Neil Young's business acumen I mean right. it's as simple as that he might be a very good manager I, who knows or, or he might be one of those CEOs who is the front person of the company and actually Lots there are operating officers yeah. and you know that happens all the time so as far as is Neil Young the right person for the job mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. but but and, and I don't think anybody else knows either and that, you know and I, but I, I think the problem with it is that he's a pop star 
Yeah. And that people go, but he's a pop star. He's not a CEO. And, and it's, it's all gone horribly wrong. And all of this money that I put into this thing that I thought was going to give me nice audio uh, now has a, a lunatic at the, at the helm. And what are we going to do? I, who knows? I mean, it could be something that is, is sort of, he, he might prove to be a, a very good businessman. Exactly. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, um, so. But but again, even if he does, I'm still not the right person to be able to judge whether that happened or not, because that's yeah, yeah. not my particular field of expertise. Um, but I think it's a really interesting story when you start to think about what, what is the Pono story about. It is, it is about this kind of perpetual struggle in music and technology between convenience and quality. Yeah. And, and this, this perception that, that what makes for quality is... Um, is a kind of studio quality resolution of the audio files, getting what the artist intended, overlooking the fact that actually there's a lot of processes that go on in the studio that are about kind of completely subverting what the artist intended. And, and you know, that's the job of the producer, for goodness sake. So, um, but but all of the kind of the things that stand between the, the kind of the real performance and, you know, all of the microphones, all of the processing, all of the compression, all of the, you know, those things, those are still going to be there. You're just going to hear them in, in ultra fine detail. But of course, people are still going to put it on in a room with the window open and trucks going past, or they're going to listen to it on tiny headphones or, you know, whatever it happens to be. It's not going to be this perfect listening environment that everybody expects. I'm somebody who happens to pay for um, occasionally for 24-bit audio files, and, and I'm kind of one of these ECM nerds that likes the kind of very quiet music and, and very kind of beautiful, pristine stuff. Not for everything. I, I kind of don't mind a 320k MP3 for a, for a rock record, and I, I, you know, I used to be a record producer and a sound engineer. Can't really tell the difference with most types of music. And there are some types of music where that kind of spatial extra quality of a bit becomes really, really important. Um, but that's because I have a home stereo that's worth less than ten thousand pounds, and and so um, it, it's like it's not just the box that you store the things on. It's about what you use to replicate the thing yeah. that, that becomes important. And so you know, unless you've got the speaker system and the and the array to support that, I I, I like the intention of it though. I like the idea that this is. Um, this is a format that is all about quality, and we've managed to bundle quality inside convenience. We've solved the problem. And if um, Super Audio CDs were still with us, or, or DVD Audio, or any of the other sort of high-resolution formats that have been with us, when in actual fact you find that actually the convenient formats like cassette tape are the things that sort of go on to become the big thing of their day, um, it, it remains to be seen whether that's going to be useful. And I think that's yeah. the interesting conversation is, is to, to what extent is the high-fidelity audio the quality that we need and, and to what extent is it just could, could you just give us lots of really good songs because actually that's what you're really good at yeah that would be a kind of a good conversation to have yeah absolutely and, and you know for me that the interesting thing about the fact that they've gone with omniphone is the fact that i my my, my problems with the service with the fact that I couldn't see it become a sustainable service because they've only sold 15,000 devices and you know how big of a music market can you create out of 15,000 people and even if they become 25 or 30,000 uh, uh, if you have to create the entire backend yourself if you outsource that and the overheads become much lower it may be actually yeah. more feasible to create uh, a, at least a self-preserving you know uh, service that may not make a ton of money but actually is able to survive that way uh, Eric what do you think well, I think I, I couldn't agree more with um, what you've both said, you know, if you look at it as a separate thing, which is a device, and you're selling a device that gives you quality, and you know, $400 isn't a vast amount of money, although, you know, the majority of people that spend money on music would not spend that much money on a device. But, you know, Apple made a freaking fortune off of selling something that somebody else would put music onto. Yeah. So that I think that conceivably, it's there is a business there, but it does worry me. This the really limited number of people that have actually signed up to it. You know, Although, like to be fair, 000. to be fair on that point, though, the people who have bought that are likely to spend more money on music Absolutely. than most people who will buy cheap MP3 players. Yeah, yeah. but twenty five dollars an album. It's a, it's a much, much higher price point. I I don't know. I I just think in order to make it really big, then, then it, it's kind of missing the mark a bit. But then they potentially don't need to make it really big. You know, if they can build something that's sustainable, I think going back you know, to the uh, Rhapsody on Radio thing again, it's like you may not need to be doing something that's kind of like groundbreaking in terms of sales, but actually if you do it really well, it's the Field of Dreams thing. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. Like, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no, you know, I'm fascinated by the story and I can't wait for the Pono to come out, uh, hopefully by the end of the year or in early 2015, to, uh, uh, you know, see how, how it works and how people react to it. And uh, that was all for this week's show. We skipped a couple of stories, but there was too much to talk about and we've already gone over our allotted time. But I would like to thank you um, uh, profusely for uh, taking the time to come on the show today, Andrew and Eric. Thank you. Such thank a, you very much, Andrew. And, and uh, actually, I should say, because I don't know if, if people ever do, but thank you so much for doing this, because this is such a valuable thing that you do for the, the whole mm. music community. It's, it's just, thank you. It's such a great thing that exists, and I'm really glad to be part of it. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, hopefully, hey. uh, I got, I, uh, this was a f the funny stage where I started to get uh, sort of... 20, 30 emails from students from all sorts of different courses and universities asking for uh, interviews for the dissertations. <laughs> 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 I tried to accommodate as many as I could, but <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> thanks so much for your time, and thanks again for listening to the DMT show. You can check out digitalmusictrends.com and follow us on Twitter on at DigiMusicTrends. Have a fantastic week, and until uh, next time.